Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out, space, out, space. Out, space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one, Guns of Humanity, written by Hamster IV. Excerpt from a guest lecture on interspecies relations. 547794.08, Galactic Standard Time, Sandraxus III, Alliance War College, Gerthard Warcast, Commander First Cloth, Aether Merrick. Greetings, cadets, and thank you for inviting me to talk with the most esteemed war college. As those of you who took time to read the syllabus know, I've been on assignment to study the human method of war as part of the Galactic Alliance Military Exchange Program. I hope what you learn here will be helpful in understanding the newest member of the race in the Alliance. The first thing to understand the human way of fighting is to understand the human's primary infantry weapon, the gun. While all races possess portable ranged weaponry of some sort, most are like ours, based on projecting and electromagnetic energy. The few races who utilize kinetic weapons make use of long acceleration rails, low-velocity acidic heat projectiles, or biodirectional kinetic energy release. Humans are unique in their apparent disdain for the laws of physical motion that they would absorb the lethal quantities of kinetic energy into their bodies as a mean of harming their foes. The gun is partially enclosed metal cylinder humans hold up close to their body. A small explosive charge is detonated inside the cylinder in order to accelerate the high-density projectile. As a side effect, the gun is slammed back into the operator's body with a force sufficient to crack the exoskeleton of a Yundane war drone. The guide I was assigned to called this recoil and took great pains to explain the proper way to compensate for it when firing on full auto. A term that I was later to find while it involves suffering several dozen recoils over the time of span of seconds. It is a testament to the human's resilient nature that they would subject their bodies to such punishment for the purpose of waging war. In addition to the physical damage of absorbing the gun's recoil, these heinous devices emit a noise that well, of the lightning bolt striking the ground. To be in close proximity to such a noise is extremely disorienting, and I found myself unable to walk straight for several minutes after the weapon's demonstration. Yet, I saw several human cadets conduct feats of incredible dexterity while discharging their guns or having louder explosions occur in proximity. I can only conclude that either humans sense of orientation by different means than we do, or they just don't care. When I inquired why the humans have not made use of quieter, more efficient range weapons provided by the Galactic Alliance Technology Exchange, my guide muttered something about reliability and how they did not complement the existing human military doctrines. This brings me to the core of the humans' warfare doctrine, their aptly named shock and awe. To the human military planners, it is not enough to kill your foes, drive them off an objective, or force them to surrender. The human guide stressed that the importance of breaking the enemy's will to fight. Human history is filled with examples of captured soldiers rejoining the war, occupied populations overthrowing their conquerors, and routed soldiers rallying to turn the tide of battle. To compensate, the human military technology evolved to be louder and more traumatic than anything our galactic peers have yet devised. Even from a safe lookout point many miles away from the live fire exercise, I could hear the screams of their supersonic aircraft, the dull thud of their artillery, and the ever-present crackle of gunfire. To be in the middle of such a cacophony must be the closest thing a living being can experience to the religious equivalent of hell. You may wonder, then, how the human infantry, whose job it is to create a dreadful spectacle, emerge with their sanity intact. First off, they are incredibly resilient as a species. They would have to be to choose these guns as their primary implement of waging war. 
Human males, through quirk of evolution, publicly seek out activities that are dangerous, violent, and or painful as a way of proving their suitability as mates. As for human females, their process of gestating and extruding a single new human puts such stresses on their body that there is statistically significant chance that they will be killed in the process. It is said that the default human condition is one of suffering. Rather than take steps to lesser the human trauma, humans have openly embraced it. Culturally, their media glorifies aggressiveness, stubbornness, and self-sacrifice above all else. Even if a human soldier is killed before they have a chance to mate, they gain a sort of spiritual immortality through the endless retellings of their story. Those that were first-hand witnesses are often viewed as desirable mates. Should the human survive an ordeal that by all rights should have ended their terrifyingly resilient life, they gain an almost premium mating status. On top of the human media's factual record-keeping, these strange minds fabricate fictional accounts of unstoppable monsters and invisible predators. The perverse creativity of the human uh, horror movies spawn imaginary foes that are far in excess of what the known universe has ever created. Yet humans seem to enjoy these spectacles as form of entertainment. By the time the human is of age to volunteer for military service, their minds have already been exposed to the hopelessness of fighting something stronger than them and the fear of being hunted by something crueler than them. I must also point out that human military is an all-volunteer force. Each and every human soldier had chosen a life where their training would be considered an illegal form of torture by galactic alliance if inflicted on unwilling criminals. Each one is looking to perform deeds of such stupefying bravery that they will outshine the heroes of their own terrifying mythology. To see humanity make war is to see the universe at its most violent and hateful. Their civilians are not much better than their military counterparts. Their colonists aggressively seek out worlds with hostile environments and native life forms. They delight in bending the ecosystem to their will. Humans glorify the first to accomplish the feat no matter how pointless or self-destructive. They will walk across polar wastes for the privilege of being the first to part of a bag on top or bottom of a planet. They will capture the most ferocious of predators to be the first to ride one. They will endure a suffering and death beyond what any rational mind would consider healthy just to be remembered. My advice to you, young cadets, is to utilize our human allies for a task that requires the least amount of subtlety and where collateral damage is most acceptable. Assaults on fortified positions, mountain, jungle warfare, and capital ship boarding operations are the best places to utilize the human shock and awe method of fighting. Do not employ humans in urban warfare unless the urban population is also human. The post-liberation suicide rate never makes for good press. Should you find yourself in opposition to a human force, the best option is to wait for friendly human reinforcements. Humanity has a long history of intraspecies violence. Ultimately, they are the best trained and adapted to deal with their own kind. If no friendly human relief forces are available, it is best to engage humans from a sturdy vehicle, preferably in the upper atmosphere of orbit, under no circumstances should you or soldiers under your command engage in the infantry level against human soldiers or criminal elements. It is better to surrender than endure the trauma of shock and all style assault. When dealing with survivors of the shock and or assault, sedate them immediately and place them on suicide watch for the next five solar cycles. To do less would be criminally negligent. Most importantly, Never accept an invitation to fire a gun or participate in joint assault with human forces. It may seem impolite to our allies, but our species is neither psychologically nor physiologically prepared for that sort of trauma. The human's method of war is thankfully unique in the known universe, and we should be forever grateful that they have chosen to employ it for our benefit rather than our conquest. End of story. Story number two. 40k and they shall know fear. Written by Slayer of Foes. 
They shall be my finest warriors. These men who give themselves to me likely I shall mold them, and in the furnace of war forge them. They will be of iron, wool, and steely muscle. In great armor shall I glad them, and with the mightiest guns they will be armed. They will be untouched by plague or disease. No sickness will blight them. They will have tactics, strategies, and machines so that no foe can best them in battle. They are my bulwark against the terror. They are the defenders of humanity. They are the space marines, and they shall know no fear. He knew fear, just as he knew every rivet and every weld and every internal part of his last gun, as he knew word for word the pamphlet full of inspiration that he no longer had. He knew it, just as he knew where each and every location on each and every planet was where its vest, nothing more than paper to most weapons, had saved his life. He knew his name, his rank, and his duty. He knew fear, whether it was the fear of his average life expectancy he had long since passed. A veteran, not because of how many battles he'd seen, though he'd seen many, but rather because he'd survived longer than average. He was a veteran of a dozen battles on a dozen worlds where he had but one mission. Hold the line. He knew fear, just as he knew with certainty in his bones that his life was not worth living, but for the killing he could do in the Emperor's name, that his death was not a tragedy, but a statistic. But yet, a statistic that was so small that he could die one million times and still be considered a rounding error, and not even a noticeable one. He knew fear. The otherworldly menaces, the ancient techno-horrors, the Xenos, and even fallen brothers who he had once served beside. They could each take his life and those that he had sworn to protect, those he could not protect themselves. He knew fear from his own side as well, from charges of heresy to friendly fire to one trigger-happy commissioner, trying to improve morale to a faulty equipment, taking him out just for standing nearby. He knew fear. He donned his vest. He knew fear. He grabbed his gun and slotted the battery in. He knew fear. He strapped his helmet on. He knew fear. He tucked his primer under his vest. He knew fear. He rushed to the front. He knew fear. He affixed his bayonet. He knew fear. He charged the enemy side by side with his squad, with his battalion, with his regiment. And all over the galaxy, the guard changed. And they held the line. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.